but they're not now, right? Somehow you do that. So you, to do that, you have to stretch space out faster than the speed of light. That tends to bug people. Uh, but, it, but, but it's not against Einstein's law, it's not against the speed of light, because you're not communicating through space faster than the speed of light, you're stretching space out faster than the speed of light. Right? That's okay. So, it sounds kind of uh, um, uh, crazy, perhaps. Uh, it is, as, as you'll learn, it's, it is a very compelling theory at this point. It's passed many tests. Um, but, but here's one thing. If you were to take, you know, we're talking about a subatomic spot and stretching it out uh, to larger than our observable universe. Imagine you just took a piece of paper and crumpled it up as tightly as you could and stretched it out like that and then said, let's look at, at, at what that paper looks like that we can now see. It would look perfectly smooth. Any of those the crunches or wrinkles in that would be just smoothed out, right? And you, you, you know, a little crease would be bigger than Palo Alto. You wouldn't see it. And so the idea is that if this is right, that, that if we look at how space is curved, you know, as there's distortions in space on large scales, we should see that it's not curved, right? And so that's one of the things we want to test with the, with the cosmic microwave background, and I'm going to try to walk you through that. So, but here's the other cool thing about this whole uh, theory of inflation and, and what we believe to be true is that the, the, when we look at this image, this beautiful image came from the Kobe satellite, uh, you could say, well, it just looks like noise. Uh, but really, it's this direct view of quantum mechanical fuzz or this uncertainty, right? Or another way of saying that is the largest thing in the universe began from subatomic quantum fluctuations. We have a quantum origin to our universe. So how are we going to test whether the space is flat? Well, here's the, here's the, the outline, and this actually comes from a, a, a textbook, so I'd like to show this. Uh, this is like a college uh, uh, survey course in astronomy textbook. Um, we, can, we can calculate, you know, given the origin of the universe, kind of winding time backward from the expansion of the universe, we can tell when the universe should have been hot enough that it was all ionized and when it was very dense, and we can see how big structures could have formed, right? And uh, so we can kind of have a ruler by how big we see these structures. We can calculate that, you know, in dimensions and in, in centimeters. Uh, and then we can see how big it looks. And if space is curved, like on the surface of a globe or something, although we're talking in you know, uh, higher dimensions, you know, what you see is going to look distorted because space, the space lines are curved. If it's just flat, Euclidean, or uncurved space, you know, what you see is what you get. Uh, if it's open, it'll look the other way around. So what we want to do is measure this cosmic microwave background and see which one it is. The problem, or not the problem, but Kobe couldn't do this because these scales have to do with kind of what we call the horizon scale, how fast, how far light or sound could have traveled in the early universe. It's much, much smaller than the scales that, that Kobe measured. So you have to build higher resolution instruments. This was done uh, by a whole bunch of uh, experiments trying to do this early, uh, um, around 2000. This was one uh, by Andrew Lang and his team called Boomerang. Uh, they launched this very, very sensitive microwave antennas. They launched it up, uh, up to about 100,000 feet to get above the atmosphere. They let it go around in this polar vortex. We hear a lot about polar vortexes in Chicago <laughs> these days. Uh, this is a, a different one. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, collect this data, just tremendous data, and they make this map of a part of the sky. Not the whole sky, but a big chunk of the sky. Around the same time, actually just a bit later, we were down at the South Pole. I'll talk more about the South Pole later. Uh, and put this telescope up there. And uh, there's a, a close-up of the telescopes and graduate students and postdocs working on it uh, with me. Um, it's another, one, one thing uh, you know, I should have told you that, that every cosmic microwave telescope is odd looking. This is no exception. It's an interferometer combining the signals from all these little telescopes uh, microwave telescopes. We waited for the sun to set, which is kind of fun at the South Pole. It takes uh, days. Uh, actually, we had left, but our winter rovers were there. Um, and then we made that winter and that one polar night these images. So these are all not whole sections of the sky, but they're all about the size of your hand, looking at different spots. And, and right away, you can see they look very similar. They, I mean, not that they're identical, but the same kind of structure, same scales. And that is not 
the resolution of our telescope. It was much higher than, than, than the kind of characteristic spots you see. So you go to the same textbook, and you can now take these images and say, which one's right? And is, 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 is space curved? Is it flat? And if you think inflation is right, this is what inflation predicts. Or is it this funny open shape? And, and this is what you get. It's boomerang, all right? And this was very, very big news uh, about 10 years ago. The curvature of the universe is flat. So there's a couple of, of, of things about that. One is, well, that's a great test for this, this origin of the universe, this idea that we inflated. But once you know that, that matter curves space, through Einstein's equations, you also know, uh, uh, you know matter curves space. We know the curvature of space, so we could solve for its density on average scales, right? And that is about three hydrogen atoms equivalent per cubic meter. That's a, a big volume for three atoms. That far exceeds the best vacuum you could ever, ever hope uh, to produce on Earth, right? It's just, uh, you can't do that, right? It's, but there's a lot of space out there, so it adds up, right? And to give you a sense of how special it is to be here on Earth, the average density in this room uh, is, is something like that, right? 10 to the 26 times larger, right? Um, and not only that, I, I noticed, I shouldn't digress because I'll run out of time, but I noticed uh, this periodic table of the elements. And um, in this big bang, this kind of thing, what we're talking about, all we have is hydrogen, helium, little lithium, that's it. Everything else we now know is produced in stars. So it's, it's a great story. But anyway, let's get, get back to the story here, a bit more qualitative. You, you might not believe this, but we don't hire a bunch of graduate students and give them a bunch of maps and say which ones are, are the same, which ones look similar, which ones don't. Uh, we actually uh, get a little more quantitative, and we look at these maps just like you would look at uh, sound waves. And in fact, what I told you earlier, it is sound waves. What we're seeing are the sound waves. We're seeing where it's compressed and where it's rarefied, and we're capturing, capturing a snapshot of that. So you can, you've seen these equalizers, where this is the base, and it's how much power in the base, and the treble. Um, and you're used to thinking, well, I can turn the base down. But remember, sound is just this, it's just this pressure going with time. And yet you can think in your head, well, I'll turn the base down, I'll turn the treble up. You're, you're shaping the spectrum, right? And so just like this shows the spectrum of sound, right, we can take those images and say how many long wavelength features or bass-like notes, how many treble, and we could get a spectrum of, of, of the early universe, right? And the cool thing is it actually is telling us about sound waves in the early universe, right? And, you know, I know you've seen these before, uh, these equalizers, and you play with these things. So the... Uh, uh, New York Times, actually, when we first got our results, thought, yeah, everyone understands spherical harmonic transforms. <laughs> uh, and put that in there. Um, but you can see this already, all right? There's, it was a funny, this was from Daisy and Boomerang. Uh, actually, this is just the Daisy results from our experiment. Uh, uh, and this is measuring the bass notes or long wavelengths on the sky, and this was measuring short, and there already was this funny pattern. You would kind of think it'd just be noise, but it was this funny pattern, right? And I'll talk more about that in a second. So a satellite was up, another satellite from NASA, uh, WMAP it was called, named after uh, Dave Wilkinson here, who designed it and, and built it. Uh, so this is the COBE map. They had higher resolution and more sensitivity, uh, and were able to do that. So this is similar resolution to DAISY, um, uh, but covering the whole sky. So we could take a transform, well, I don't want to use the word transform, but we could look at this and say, what does its spectrum look like? Uh, and it's spectacular, right? So here are the bass notes, and here are the, the uh, treble, right? And it's not just noise. There's this beautiful tone, right? And that tone has an overtone, and another overtone, and then you can decide what's going on here. Um, it's, it's phenomenal, right? And, and um, uh, the universe is like ringing like a bell. I mean, it's, we look at the early universe, we can measure, you know, the spectrum, what it looks like. You kind of expect noise. Uh, well, Andre didn't expect noise, but some people like expected noise. And instead, we see this beautiful spectrum. There's a line going through here. That line 
is a fit from a basic model of a universe that starts with inflation. Right, so that's just another wonderful test. Uh, and the fact that this peak is right where it is, is telling us the universe is flat. That's just telling us what size scale we see these big structures at. But we can do a lot more with this, right? So you know that if you play a violin or you take a note, you know, what's the spectrum of that? You know it's not just a beautiful note, there's harmonics, right? Just like we're seeing harmonics in the universe. If there were no harmonics, it would sound terrible, and every instrument would sound the same, it would sound like one of those little computer tones, right? It'd be boring. Uh, that's what gives it some richness. But just like with, with the, uh, with the uh, a violin or hearing that, you can tell from that spectrum what's made out of, what it's, what, what it's made up of. So for the CMB, what we're seeing is, well, how many photons are causing the oscillations to push back? How much dark matter is pulling it in together? What, how do these interplay? By, by seeing that harmonic spectrum, we can figure out you know, the ratio of how much stuff is in there. And remember, we already know the total. We know the total average density, three equivalent uh, mass of three protons uh, per cubic meter. So, so we could put this story together, what the universe is made out of, right? And uh, probably many of you have seen this, but I never really get tired of it. You know, we already told you there's no center. We're not at the center. I mean, Copernicus said we weren't at the center of the sun. We're not at the center of the universe. We're not even made out of the stuff that makes up the universe. So uh, this 4%, that 4% of this kind of total, that's all the matter you can find in the textbook. That's everything you know about, that we know what it is. This 22%, uh, that's this so-called dark matter. We know it's out there. Astronomers have actually known about it for 80 years, and physicists are even believing it in the last 20 or so. Uh, but the reason they're believing it is because of observations like this that show it has to be there and shows it's not ordinary matter. It's not interacting with light. It's not just rocks. It's something else. Uh, here it is near the universe. The big uh, 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 mystery here uh, is, is the rest. And so we use this trick. This trick is uh, uh, one that uh, Bill Clinton espoused at the uh, Democratic National Convention. It's this trick called arithmetic. <laughs> we know the total, we know this, and from these measurements anyway, we solve for the rest and we get this thing uh, which we could call dark energy, right? So we've discovered this thing called dark energy uh, and actually the best model to date, and, and I'm gonna talk about how we're gonna test that, uh, uh, with the South Pole Telescope, is it's Einstein's cosmological constant, which today would be interpreted as an energy of the vacuum. Empty space is not empty, it has energy, right? Uh, that doesn't mean that we know that's the case, but that fits. Um, and one reason why uh, um, we, we believe this, or why we you know, jump to that, is actually even before those measurements were very close to that, uh, uh, people were measuring supernova they had learned how to figure out how bright, by looking at how a supernova evolves, how intrinsically bright it is, right? Which is great. Supernova are, are, are enormously bright. This is a special kind of supernova. Uh, and this is, it looks like an artist's conception. This is actually a Hubble Space Telescope picture. This is real. They can outshine a whole galaxy. They're really bright. You can see them, you know, way across the observable universe. And if you can calculate how bright they really are, then you can calculate how far away they are because you know, to get as dim as you see them, they must be farther and farther away. So, so people said, this is fantastic. They're gonna go out and measure the history, kind of the expansion of the universe, and look for the deceleration parameter. There's all this mass in the universe. The universe is accelerating. Well, how fast is it slowing down? That's a way to measure how much mass is in the universe. Right? We just showed you another way to do that. But here's another way. And what they found out, of course, uh, is it's not slowing down. It's not even coasting, it's speeding up. The acceleration is speeding up, right? And Einstein's cosmological constant, or these models of dark energy have to account for that. And, and um, the idea is that there's basically a force, like an anti-gravity, uh, but a property of space perhaps, or a new particle, we're not, we're, we don't really know what it is, that's causing the expansion of the universe to speed up, right? So here's the schematic. Uh, uh, you, you have a, a, a timeline of the universe, right? So you have at, at very early times uh, this inflation, some burst. This is, you know, NASA put, NASA's got a lot of money to make these wonderful uh, pictures. This burst, exponential expansion, faster than the speed of light, not 
not an explosion with stuff going faster than the speed of light, space expanding faster than the speed of light from some subatomic scale to enormous scales. So in this plot, this is time, of course, going that way, but back, this radial component is trying to represent the expansion history. So this rampant exponential expansion, it has to end at some point. Uh, when it ends, it cools off, and, and so the expansion is slowing down. Uh, uh, the universe cools off. We have hydrogen and, and uh, forming for the first time. And so this is the period we can see by looking at that light. This is when it's free. This is like that inside out sun, that's like its surface. We call it the surface of last scattering. We can see that. Uh, the universe is so very young uh, uh, and it's taking a while, but then gravity is slowly working over ordinary matter, causing the first stars to form. When that happens, you light up the universe again, begin to ionize things. Uh, and then you form galaxies eventually and structure and all the stuff we see around us. And then this funny thing where the expansion is starting to speed up. So I once, I once showed this talk uh, to a very uh, uh, esteemed group, the Board of Trustees at the University of Chicago, and I showed this slide in a talk and you know, they seemed to really like it. And then afterwards, one of them said, why is the universe shaped like, a, like that trumpet? <laughs> right? so, so, that's not the point, it is <laughs> representative. So, so this, is, this is the picture we have of our universe, and it all fits, in fact it fits basically all the data we have, but here's what it rests on, right? We have dark matter, we're looking for it. Dark matter is streaming through your body right now, also with about a trillion neutrinos coming from the, the, from the early universe. Um, and we don't know how to detect of those neutrinos, these low energy neutrinos and dark matter. We haven't detected them. We like to. Uh, we we uh, 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 have experiments here at SLAC. We have experiments deep in minds trying to detect dark matter. Right? If you'll, you'll hear about it. That's fantastic. Dark energy. Right? Well, there's another one. Dark here is because it doesn't interact with light. Dark here is kind of... Uh, I know it's a catchy phrase. It means we don't really know what it is, but it's contributing to the energy density. It's doing it in such a way it's causing space to expand, to accelerate, right? And, and the simplest model for this is a cosmological constant. And then it's starting with this period of inflation, very high energies, rampant exponential expansion. So, so you know, a great model. Um, I don't know how strong the pillars are, but it seems to me we've got to go and, and test this. So what I'm going to do in the remaining part of this talk is try to show you uh, one test we've done in this telescope and, and a little bit about where we're headed for testing uh, inflation as well. But let me say before I go any further, this fits all the data. This is a lot of other models have been thrown out. This is really remarkably successful. Anyway, here's what is dark energy. So let me give you a, show you a cartoon uh, and, and about this. So, so one thing is, you know, to think about, you know, the universe is expanding, there's all this matter in it, and you would think it's going to slowly contract and fall in. That's kind of like saying if I took a baseball and threw it up in the air, I expect it to go and slow down and come back. Dark energy is like saying I take that baseball and it goes in the air and it's starting to slow down and then it speeds up and goes away, right? That's, that's what's going on uh, with the universe. So, so here's, here's a... Uh, 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 just an idea of, of a test you can do. So in the early universe, if, 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 if it's Einstein's cosmological constant, it's a property of the vacuum, empty space, right? It's empty, so it's not empty, it has some finite energy. Uh, um, then when you look at the cosmic microwave background, the scale factor of the universe was uh, uh, a thousand times smaller. The density was a thousand cubed, 10 to the nine, a billion times higher. So all the matter was much more dense. So for a given amount of, uh, you know, uh, a volume, you have the same amount of that, the same amount of space, but you have a lot more matter. And so what the name of the game is gravity and dark matter pulling things together. We're here today, the galaxies are there because gravity was effective. That's, that's what was forming things in the universe. Uh, uh, so in this kind of tug of war for dark matter trying through gravity, trying to pull everything together, you know, dark energy was unimportant. But as time goes on, the universe is expanding, you're diluting all of this stuff, uh, but you're not, you know, the vacuum is the vacuum. Uh, then you find out that, you know, the pulling power, the amount of matter in the universe and the amount that they can pull together uh, is getting weaker. 
Right? Gravity is the same, it's just less force. You're, you're, it's, it's, things are getting farther away. Right? Uh, and today, today, it's about two to one. Dark energy is, is, is winning out, and that's why we see the universe uh, expansion actually accelerating. And if you continue this trend, tomorrow, um, you know, we have rampant exponential expansion, right? So, yeah, it does. It seems kind of crazy, uh, but that, that's what fits. So it seems to me we ought to try to figure out a way to test this, right? And so the measurements have been done uh, by measuring geometry. One way to test this is let's measure its impact. Let's try to measure this tug of war. Let's try to see if actually if we look at how structure grew in the universe, does it fit this model? Can, you know, given the initial conditions, give me a, a model for dark energy like Einstein's cosmological constant. We can tell how structure should have formed, when it formed, how much. And we're going to do that test uh, by looking at the largest objects the universe has ever produced. And, and these are uh, a largest kind of bound objects that gravity has pulled together. These are clusters of galaxies. They're incredibly beautiful objects. I don't know if you can see. These, all, these are all galaxies. It's a very dense uh, environment. These little look like scratches. Those are, are, are arcs from background galaxies that the light is being bent. It goes by this enormous mass. Right? In fact, we can tell the mass in here is about 100,000 times the mass of our own galaxy or 10 to the 15 times the mass of our sun, right? Enormously massive. And the galaxies, which look absolutely, you know, beautiful and spectacular, are a very small fraction of that, you know, a couple percent. You know, that's it. Um, um, and I'll, I'll show you what else is in there. But what we can do is, is most of it's dark matter, but there's another very important component. Uh, and what we can do then is look at when do these objects form? Are they still forming? Uh, uh, have they stopped forming? And, and that's going to give some indication of, of whether our models for dark energy and expansion of the universe are correct or not. Right? So this is uh, in optical light. If you look in x-ray, all right, so uh, the trick is, if we're going to do this experiment, we can't just find a couple and be done. We have to find them all, right? And then map out this, this structure. And they're very rare and they're hard to find, especially distance ones. So, you know, we have to figure out a clever way to do this. So this is, it looks all I did is change the background here, but what I did is added uh, X-ray emission done with the Chandra Space Telescope, your, your, your space telescope. Uh, and uh, now I'm going to remove the optical image, right? And so when you look at these clusters of galaxies in X-rays, so just very short wavelengths, you see this glowing gas, right? In fact, it's this gas that's glowing. It's very hot gas. Uh, it's about uh, 10... 100, sorry, 100 million degree gas, all the elements are ionized again. So you have this condition where you've got a whole bunch of ionized gas again, right? So if you have one of those lowly, little, uh, uh, weak cosmic microwave background photons trying to go through this gas, well, it's like the electrons free and that they can scatter again. And when they do that, they want to scatter uh, to higher energies. They're trying to, to, they're trying to heat up the, the, the photons, give them more energy. They're, they're, it's like the Robin Hood effect. You're stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. Right? So this is a, a schematic of that where, where you, know, you have this hot gas, you've got a photon coming through here, and it usually goes right through. It's only about a percent chance it'll scatter, but occasionally it'll, one of these photons will scatter, and when it does, it gets scattered to higher energies on average. Right? And so what this does is it will, we look at long wavelengths and we look at the cosmic microwave background, these clusters of galaxies, these beautiful objects should show up, the, mo one of the most luminous things in the universe should show up as shadows. We should see them as shadows against the cosmic microwave background. Right? So we have, we have, they're going to be weak shadows. You know, the depression is going to be about a part in 10 to the 4, very weak shadow. But if we can detect them, we can detect them wherever they are, because we're looking all the way back for shadows against the background. Right? So this is called, this idea of doing that is called the uh, sunyayev zeldovich effect, named after uh, uh, Zeldovich and, and uh, Sunyayev, Rashid Sunyayev here. And here's a, uh, he was a student at the time, uh, and here he is receiving the, uh, uh, the Crawford Prize ceremony. It's kind of like the Nobel Prize for astronomy uh, um, for this work and much other work. He's uh, done fantastic work. And what we're going to do is try to detect this effect. 
Now, we're looking for a small defect in the cosmic microwave background. It's, it's small, so we can't use these big beam experiments. We have to get high resolution. We can't change the wavelength. We have to look at the wavelength with the light emits. So we have to be, build a big telescope to get the resolution. And here's our telescope. It's 10 meters. Uh, it's a kilometer from the geographical South Pole. We're down at the South Pole for a number of reasons. One is uh, it is the driest desert on Earth. It's so cold that even if the air is saturated, there's almost no water in it. It just can't hold any water. Uh, the ice is a continent, and, and the ice layer is two miles thick, so we're actually fairly high. And the other thing is that for six months of the year, the sun, of course, is a, you know one day, one night a year, the sun goes behind the Earth, uh, and it gets incredibly cold, so even drier, and very, very stable. And the sun is a big source of microwaves, so it's a wonderful place to observe. Uh, the next best place is to go into space, actually even better, is space, get above the atmosphere. But it's hard to get a 10 meter aperture telescope. Uh, in fact, this one weighs 700,000 pounds. Uh, it's hard to get such stuff on a balloon or in space, so we're, we're down here. Uh, it has the resolution of, of your eye. So the telescope is 10 meters, your eye is about four millimeters. But if you expand, you know, four millimeters to 10 millimeters, expand visible light to microwaves, that ratio is about the same. All right. Here's the crew, uh, just a snapshot of the crew. It's almost all students and, uh, and postdocs who do this work. And I'm gonna take a little break and give you a, a kind of a travelogue, maybe give you a sense of what it's like to go down there. Uh, so you take commercial flights, uh, which I was going to say, then you're treated like cargo, but commercial flights, you're treated like cargo already. Uh, but then you're down there and you're, you're treated to these flights. So you go to Christchurch, New Zealand, that's where the United States uh, Antarctic Program has a base. They give you all the clothes to wear. Uh, all you need to really bring is underwear. Uh, and then you get on one of these globe masters. This is what it looks like inside. They're huge. Uh, you know, your cargo with everything else. Um, there are no window seats. In this case, the aisles are seats, not aisle seats. There's one little window on the door, which you can look out, and that's great. You arrive uh, down uh, and land on the sea ice. So this is landing uh, outside of Ross Island uh, on the sea ice, and it's kind of unnerving. The first time you go, it's all seemed fine, but when you've left here, they move, and, and this is open water if you come back in January, and yet they're le uh, landing these amazing plants down there. Uh, this is uh, McMurdo Station, uh, and I like to show this picture because this is uh, um, a Scott's cabin from his 1911 expedition, in fact, where he died. Uh, and you can actually go in there, it's pretty much left as the crew left it, and there's even old seals uh, in there, a seal meat that's been there for over, well, it's, it was a, uh, 1911, yeah, it's over 100 years now. And uh, when I was there one time, you often see a lot of uh, life here on the coast. One time we came and we were there and all these penguins were coming in. And of course we thought, well, they're curious and they, uh, they want to know about us. They, they uh, as far as they're concerned, you're, you're like one of the rocks. They come up, they walk around you, but their god uh, is this icebreaker. So for, you know, tens and tens of kilometers out, this icebreaker comes in and brings the water to them, and they just flock around the icebreaker. Um, anyway, it's kind of fun to see them. Anyway, that's, that's, uh, that's McMurdo, and I should say, um, um, there it is. That's kind of what it looks like. It's, 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 um, it's not picturesque, the town, but when you look around from there, it's beautiful. Then you uh, board another one of these interesting planes. In this case, it's a ski-equipped Hercules. I love the names they give these, turboprop, uh, and that's how you get to the South Pole. You fly up over the Antarctic Alps uh, and have these, you know, you can see I'm looking through one of those little windows, but just incredible uh, scenery. These glaciers are amazing uh, uh, to see. Then you get high up on the Antarctic Plateau, and then it's just uh, flat as far as you can see. Actually, it's hard to tell uh, quite what's wrong with the projection. This, that's the... Uh, 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 that's the um, horizon there. This is the runway, uh, and this is the station. The station is a building here. Everyone lives in that. This is now what's been about 50, actually 50 years of, of them storing things. That's the, <laughs> the junkyard, and our telescope is over here. It's about a kilometer. Everything 
absolutely everything that goes down there has come in and out of one of these planes, including every piece of our telescope. Um, so you have to design for that. Uh, here we are at the ceremony, uh, some of us at the...